I'd like to welcome Kai Backman here to give a talk. Kai was at Google for about five years. He left nine months ago to co-found Tinkercad, which he's going to tell us about now. Kai. Okay. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm going to start by doing the demo, because that's obviously the cool part. Um, and then we can actually talk about what you saw in a bit. Um, this is Tinkercad. Uh, it's a website. You can go to it right now. It's called tinkercad.com. Um, it's a solid modeling CAD. Um, we're super feature rich. Uh, when we get illusions of grandeur, we keep calling ourselves the Microsoft Paint of CAD, which gives you kind of a, a rating how good we actually are. Um, there's, um, we don't feature just one tool. We feature two separate tools, two separate tools. Um, the first tool is you can add stuff. That's pretty cool, right? See, right there. Um, you can add all kinds of different stuff, um, round, whatever. Uh, and the second tool is you can subtract stuff. So if you just added stuff, now you can take a piece away. Excellent. Um, you can always do stuff like you can change the plane where you're taking stuff away or adding stuff. So you get slightly more complex shapes. Um, you can actually rotate the plane so that you, you take stuff away at a different angle, and this gives you more complexity. But this is more or less the full application. You can add material to your model, the, the thing you're modeling. You can take away material, and they can change the work plane at, at where you put the material in and change, somewhat change the shape of the thing. So that's all there is to it. Um, say again. Can you be precise? Yes. So, OK. So the question was, can you be precise about the work plane? Yes, there's a little widget here, which you can basically use to rotate the plane in different around to get, get something that's slightly more specific than you want it to. You get angles and so forth. You have some basic measurement tools. But let's not go into that. That sounds like we're actually doing stuff. Right? That, that, like, we're not that high end yet. We do it, but let's not talk about it. Um, what you're seeing, though, is that this is a solid model. Um, I'm not going to show the demo again. I just want you to kind of get a, give a glimpse of what the application is all about. It's a simple website. Uh, the URL you see up there is a permalink. So if one of you guys typed in that URL, you would actually see this model. Uh, you could copy it and start editing it again. You can tweet it. You can mail it and so forth. So um, that's, still, that's all there is to it. Um, now we're done. You can go home now. Uh, unless you want to know what's behind the covers. So. It's a deceptively simple application, uh, but what's going, what's going on behind all of it is actually pretty interesting. So um, this is a browser cloud-based application. Uh, first thing you notice, we're using WebGL for rendering. Uh, we basically launched a public beta a few weeks ago, more or less two weeks after Chrome and Firefox went stable with the WebGL implementation. So uh, there hasn't really been a possibility to doing anything like this earlier. There wasn't, Flash doesn't have good 3D support. There isn't really a good way to visualize 3D meshes before. This is really cool. Like we're totally indebted to the Chrome and, uh, Chrome and Firefox teams for getting, getting all the WebGL stuff working in the first place. Um, what's more interesting is, is this is a cloud application. We'll talk a bit more about how it works. But we actually run, we run a small 100-core cluster in New, or in New York. I think it's actually a bit bigger now. Uh, so whenever you're in operation, there's a lot more happening behind the covers than just the client updating. Um, to give you an idea, a rough idea of what, what we're talking about, it's um, 40K, uh, 14K of JavaScript, 17K of Go, uh, and then 4K of C++ um, in some tight inner loops. Um, all of what you see has been written from scratch. So we basically deploy on raw Linux machines. Um, we currently are on Linode, but we could be in almost EC2 or something else we wanted to. All we need is a, is a install Linux machine. We run our own kind of uh, systems on top of that. Everything else, like HTTP servers, et cetera, is, is written. All of those are written in Go. We helps a lot by the standard libraries, but still, it's written, by, written from scratch. Um, also, and this, this I'm fond of telling, um, People seem to think that writing a solid kernel from scratch is a bad idea. Uh, I agree. So we decided to do it four times. This is generation four. You just are seeing. We basically rewritten the whole solid core engine from scratch four times in these nine months. Uh, we're working version five or generation five. But that's something 
we can talk about next year. But um, as for now, we're going to demo or talk about the stuff we're actually running in production right now. So if you go to tinkercad.com, this tech talk is going to be about the stuff you see there. See, I skipped the demo. I did it already. Mm. The first thing I, I want, you, want you to understand is, is we're talking about solid ge geometry. Um, we're mainly targeting printers, 3D printers. Uh, what's called additive manufacturing. Uh, how, there's a bunch of te different technologies how they work, but the basic idea is that they, they deposit small amounts of materials that then, uh, then fuse together, eventually forming the final object. This is a slow process, but it's also quite pr uh, flexible and very precise process. Um, the problem is when it really boils down to, to like the hardware lines, there's usually some kind of nozzle or something and the printer driver needs to figure out when the nozzle should be squirting out stuff or when it should not be squirting out stuff. This is a very simple problem. Um, it turns out coming up with the data structure that can answer this question, should the nozzle be squirting or not, it's not straightforward. Um, there's, uh, not surprisingly, there isn't a one canonical right answer. There's, there's tons of trade-offs in terms of, of what way you want to like where you want to put your emphasis on and how, how, what kind of applications you're doing. But it turns out it's a really hard problem to come up with a good data structure for representing a solid. Um, the two main operations we are interested in is, is the basic query. Uh, if I get a volume of space or one specific point, is this point inside or outside the solid model? Um, the second question is, or second operation we want to do, Given these two solid representations, we want to do a Boolean operation on them, an AND, an OR, XOR, or a number of not very useful operations. Uh, but basically, you want to combine these two solid representations, end up with something that's still a solid, and basically how it works. Mm. No surprise, this is hard. Um, there's probably a handful of solid kernels in the world. world. And to give you an idea of how hard the problem is, um, there's uh, there's one like high-end CAD software that's so good that they actually actually include two solid kernel, kernels in it. And the instruction manual says, when you do an operation and it doesn't look right, try the other kernel. Hmm. So basically, there's there's uh, there's no way to programmatically detect when things go go bad. So they're they're basically counting on the user in some sense to figuring out that okay now things went went screwy and we need to try the other one. Um, this is a hard problem. Just to give you a hint, to, to if you think we're really smart, uh, we solved it by cheating. Um, the standard representation is called the boundary representation. This is, uh, if you don't ever done computer graphics, this is like the triangle suit. Um, very easy demonstration. This is a boundary representation. My hands are a boundary representation for a triangle. Um, it's a very, very compact representation. It, it's super, super compact, especially if you have really simple shapes like Euclidean shapes and so forth. Um, you can store this representation in very, very small amount of, of space. It's very cool in that sense. Um, the problem, main problem with it is that bad data can make the solid undefined. Um, for example, how does this work? In theory, your, your boundary doesn't have any volume. So you're kind of stuck with something where you have boundaries, but like there's an opening, and it's not clear if the space inside a triangle should be inside or outside. In theory, it should be outside because there's a connection to, to the outside space, but in most cases, the user actually wants it to be inside. And the reason they want it to be inside is now, now the hole is obviously visible and big, but in reality, uh, the hole can actually be a tiny, 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 uh, like, sub-millimeter, so tiny that you can actually see it. Usually the holes come out from floating point rounding errors. And the result is that, that if you look at the BRF, you can't actually like, well, the problem is you take the BRF, give it to a printer driver. The printer driver basically decides to turn this on or off switch roughly in this fashion, like randomly. And the end result is you end up with a blob of plastic. Um, this is not good. This is a very, very unfortunate property. Question. Sure, okay. Okay, so the question is, I'm talking about two-dimensional polygons, and we're trying to uh, build three-dimensional spaces. I'm not sure I understand the question. So if you think about a cube, a three-dimensional 
uh, kind of space, it can be represented by four squares right. uh, in space, right? Uh, in B-reps, it's all two-dimensional polygons. Okay. So they, they don't, they don't, they're not actually, in most cases, planes. Some representations use planes, which is obviously better. But in a lot of cases, what you end up is, is there, there are really polygons. So if, you, if the polygon edges are slightly ajar, you actually have a, a, a hole in the polygon representation. For example, one of the standard representations for the 3D printers, called STL, is literally triangle suit. So you have triangles, and if you have small rounding errors with the, in the triangle edges or, or in the corners, you get those holes. Does that answer a question, or, or are we talking about different things? So how do you decide what shape falls into? Ooh, excellent question. I think that's the question. Okay, so, so the question was, how do you decide uh, what's inside um, the polygon with the 2D surfaces? Um, that's actually an interesting problem. It's not trivial to figure out. Um, there's a bunch of algorithms for deciding it. One of them is called, I think, the, the fence algorithm. It basically says that you, you shoot a ray through the, the like, model, and then you count the number of hops you're doing. And then basically, like, you shoot it from infinity, or shoot it from the point you are at to infinity, and then you count the number of, of polygons you intersect. And if the, the polygon count is odd, you're inside. If the polygon count is even, you're outside. That's one algorithm, a simple one. Uh, the problem is if you need to answer this query very often, uh, then this doesn't, this isn't a very fast algorithm. Did this answer you two guys' question or? Okay. Um, another problem is combined with the previous property that you can get this kind of undefined behaviors. If you think about, for example, the ray casting example we just talked about, if there's a tiny hole and your ray happens to go out that hole, now you're basically giving the wrong answer. You don't know if, if, if you're inside or outside any longer. Um, it turns out that these algorithms, especially for doing booleans, are super tricky. Uh, they're tricky in the sense that uh, a lot of computational geometry has, has tons of edge cases. So you have the base algorithm, and then you have kind of 50 special types of conditions and special types of cases. And, and to, to do booleans correctly, you need to get all these cases right. Because if there's even one case that's wrong, uh, then basically you get a, end up creating this undefined geometry, and you, you get all the problems from before. So um, the solid kernels, almost all solid kernels today are B-reps, uh, or many of the commercial ones are B-reps. And they're good mainly because somebody, some super smart people have spent 10 years fixing every last single bug in them. So they're like, they're, their legacy isn't so much that they're in some sense superior in, in algorithmic fashion and so forth. It's just that they're really, really solid pieces of code. Like all the bugs have been fixed, they hope. Um, we're not smart enough to do B-reps, by the way, which is why, why we get to the cheating part. Um, a second bad thing is that Booleans, the running time for Booleans is, is n squared. So um, it roughly comes from you need to find intersections between triangles, more or less, to, to do a Boolean. And to calculate these sections, you, you basically, the, the, the worst running time for it is, is n squared. How, this, how you see this is if you try in, in something like Rhino or Blender or some modeling program and do Boolean operations, for example, subtract a circle from, from uh, a slab or something like that, what's going to happen is, is, this is a nice demonstration for Lehman, by the way, what's going to happen is the first 10 operations are going to be sub-second. You're like, wow, this is cool. This is super good. Um, then the next few operations are going to be like a second, two seconds, three seconds, 15 seconds, two minutes, half an hour, and then you're waiting next week. Um, should. Question, uh, so n data type matrix n cubed. Oh, sorry, n cubed, not n squared. Okay, yeah. what is n? Um, number of polygons, number of kind of uh, distinct surface elements uh, on the, uh, in the B-Rep. So if you basically had cubes, that would be good. But often what ends up happening is, is you end up tessellating the surfaces, which kind of shoots up your n, combined with the fact that that's kind of every time you do a Boolean operation, the end result usually has, has more polygons than the, the initial one you started out with. Um, this obviously isn't very good. Um, this means that Booleans are usually second-rate citizens in most, most modeling software. 
because that's just they they it's it doesn't make sense exposing something to users that that basically blows up in their face really quickly. Uh, like you saw in Tinkercad again, the only thing we have is two booleans. We have like we have the or and we have the the sub boolean more or less. We don't actually have any other operations. Um, from our point of view, we wanted to we knew initially when we started out we wanted to parallelize this algorithm. We wanted to basically make make the software run on machines that didn't have too much oomph. So we wanted something that could be parallelized in a cluster. Um, cluster parallelization of a binary representation is hard. It's not impossible, uh, but the problem is that, that you have a lot of this global state, how, how the kind of polygons interact. Uh, basically, you could tessellate down everything to really small triangles, but then you run, end up running into the Boolean runtime issues. Uh, and that's kind of the only way to really solve it. Then you could take those tessellate triangles make small subspaces, split those out on the cluster and so forth. But it's not entirely clear that it's very easy to do. Also, it's industry standard. This is how everybody does it. Um, the reason everybody does it is because it's compact. Um, back in the day when the, the first program started approaching in the 70s mainly, uh, memory was a big, big concern. You just did not have memory. So you needed something you, where you could squeeze it into as small space as possible. All these other things are, are kind of negotiable. If you like, if your machine has a certain amount of RAM, you can't make it bigger. It doesn't matter if, it, if this is a bad solution because this is the only solution you're gonna have. So it's a very good solution if you're low on memory. Okay, this is what we did. Um, we use a volumetric uh, representation instead. Uh, we di divide space. Um, Voxels is, is something we, we, keep, we forbid ourselves from talking about, but voxels is mainly what you can think about. The, the, the format is slightly more complex than that, but uh, voxels are a good idea of how it works. I don't know if anybody played Minecraft, then you definitely know how this works. Um, we basically have, we, we take the whole space, subdivide it into small cubes. In our case, we use a cu cubic grid. Uh, and for every, every kind of little cube, we say, we store one bit of information and say, is it inside or outside? Super simple thing. Uh, there's a tiny, tiny fly in the ointment. Uh, this, this, um, the space requirements are cubic. Um, if the runtime having runtime cubic requirement is sad, having a space requirement that's cubic is, is kind of un, not good. Uh, yes, that was for our generation one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, you can orally compress it. Uh, you can do a bunch of compression stuff. So in the end, what happens is that the actual uh, growth we're seeing, like the actual space, uh, like space growth we're seeing, is is uh, squared. And in this case, n is the squared area. So basically, we're 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 seeing that that we're growing uh, basically at the at the speed that the, the the surface area of the the model grows. So if you had something like the human lung which has a crazy surface area, we'd be totally opposed by it. But most mechanical models, which is what we're targeting, actually have a very good surface area to, to kind of volume ratios. So for those cases, it works out okay. We definitely optimize for, for, for those cases. In a lot of cases, for a very complex model, um, we're not too much worse than the BREP. Because if you have a complex model, the tessellation is very high. There's a lot of triangles. So the BREP ends up storing a ton of stuff. Um, and we obviously end up storing a ton of stuff as well, but we're not that much worse. Um, the bad thing is that this is not something that can buy, be visualized directly using a comp like normal computer graphics card. That's not entirely true. Uh, in theory, you could write fragment shaders and things on, on current hardware that could actually visualize a voxel space or, or kind of volumetric data. The problem is that the amount of data is still huge. Uh, and we store it all in the cluster on the servers, and we just, the pipe from the servers to the client is a clear bottleneck. So what we do instead is we, we, we use um, a, deriv a custom derivative of marching queues to create a visualization mess, mesh, and then basically send that to the client instead. Uh, it's also important because the, the, the BREP is, the STL format is actually the standard for printers. So we need to be able to create a mesh for, to actually be able to print these things. Question. So the question is, how are we representing the the space? Doesn't it, uh, if we use an octree-like space, doesn't it get expensive on diagonals? Uh, we don't use an as, uh, as simple representation as, as said here. We use something closer to what's called a level set. 
basically uh, the sample stores how far we're from the ISO surface, which defines the inside, the, the, the boundary between the inside and outside. Uh, it turns out diagonals are not harder than everything else. It turns out everything is slow. There's no, there's no special slowness for, for it. Like the, the fact that we use a grid, kind of um, a three-ax orthogonal like cubic grid, doesn't actually add any sadness to the problem, where it's as slow and bad, even if you use some kind of, like even if you, you go against the grid or even if you go in, in direction of the grid. In theory, we could do some optimizations if, if operations were just perfectly aligned with the grid, but those operations are so rare that we actually decided not to do those optimizations. Does that answer, answer the question, right? Um, a good property is that bad ad data adds noise. So with the BREP, uh, bad data basically blows your thing up in most cases. Sometimes it's fixable. Uh, but in our case, bad days that just adds noise. So if you have like one, if you had one of these little, little uh, like issues with some corner or something, you, what you get maybe a small indentation or, or a small hole somewhere inside, which basically like that, that's the noise you get from the thing. Uh, you can occasionally see it in Tinkercad models if you go, our sampling resolution isn't super high yet. So you can occasionally see like these uh, cases where you basically are running into aliasing jitters from the fact that you, you're trying to trying to represent features that are too fine compared to the sampling density you have. Uh, the good thing is booleans are super, super straightforward to implement. You basically take the, the RLE encoded one is a good example. Uh, the first one, which I wrote, uh, which got promptly rebuilt in by somebody else much better. But the first one was basically, it's like a merge sort. You're w walking down the two RLE data structures, and then you're just like taking a span, throwing away, combining, throwing new stuff. Like it's a super simple algorithm. It's super robust. It's easy to do different types of bullets and so forth. Um, we like this. Uh, and also cluster parallelization is feasible. Mm. I say feasible as in it's still a lot of work, like any kind of distributed system, but uh, it's, it's possible to splice up the space. You, you, take, you basically say, here's, a, here's an extent of samples. I call this a block in our case. And then you take these blocks and split them out over the cluster and process each block separately. Um, there's tons of issues because, for example, the meshing requires you to have slight overlap between the blocks. So we, we depend, for example, on the Boolean operations to be deterministic, which is sometimes difficult with floats. Uh, yes, question. Yeah, um, you are really encoding probably just storing narrow band. How wide is that? Uh, so the question was, um, to do RLE encoding on, on level sets with storing a narrow band, um, we used to do uh, level sets. We no longer do. Our format is different nowadays. I think we stored, um, I think it was three samples of, of narrow band when we did it. We experimented. We we tried it out and, and saw when it started to break. And I think I think it was somewhere. It might be, might have been three or or four samples of, of narrow band. Not too much actually. Very little. Very good question. You seem to have worked with levels. It's nice. Um, if you haven't, uh, by the way, encountered level sets ever, uh, it's an interesting um, data structure. I recommend you guys look it up. It's in invented, I think, in the 80s or something for totally different purpose of physics simulations. But it's an interesting way of thinking about a problem that's very different from, from like classical, in my view, classical algorithmic thinking. So in spirit of Google, I'm going to talk about the life of an apply. Um, an apply is basically a single editing operation in our world. That's, that's one of those, like, you click, add, subtract, or something. Um, all of those get translated into an apply. It's our most interesting operation. Um, we have heartbeats and there, there's kinds of kind of supporting operations. Um, but the main reason we wrote everything from scratch is to make the apply fast. Like we wanted, you guys saw how it was. We were actually in, on the West Coast, the data center on the East Coast. Uh, it's not as fast as it could be. We wanted data center on the West Coast as well. But um, the reason it's even that fast and not doesn't take two minutes is the fact that we've been like crazily, crazily focusing on just this one operation. Our storage is basically we dump files on this to give you an idea how high tech that is. But the apply is, is where we shine. Um, so client side. Uh, you saw how the user saw it's just like click, bang, and off you go. Uh, the first thing, we put up the spinner. Uh, it's a tiny thing, but it's actually very important to give user a feel of where the operation is going to be, uh, to give them kind of a placeholder to, to mask the latency. Uh, we send off an XHR request with, with the current revision of the part we have. Um, the current revision basically contains a list of block IDs. 
to give the server an idea of what blocks the client currently has. Uh, and then we send as payload, we send apply geometry, the, the, the shape you're doing, and we say if this is an add or sub. Uh, the response contains the new revision the client is synced to. Uh, it contains a new list of block IDs. These are 64-bit unique IDs, basically saying you're in revision 205. Uh, the revision 205 contains these 200 block IDs. And then we uh, add an additional payload with that all the mesh data for those meshes that the client doesn't have already. So the server, server knows that you had, these, you had these blocks from before, you must have the representational mesh for them. Uh, so here's a new list of, of blocks you need to have, and here's like the 10 new meshes that you need to have from before. Question. So the client never had the full world just mesh data? Okay, so the question was, the client never has the full world geometry just the mesh data. Yes, correct. Uh, the client doesn't have enough space, and, and we like the the blow up isn't like a model like that is probably um, a few hundred meg or so. But if you take JavaScript blow up, it would be like a gig or something. And also, it's it's a few hundred megs in very compressed form, and that would be it doesn't make any sense to have the data on the client side really. So so all we all we send back is is the representational mesh for for the thing. Um, okay, well, XML HTTP request, thank you. So the question was, what's the XHR stand for? It's a uh, Microsoft invented technology to make the web better. I don't think they meant it that way, but that's what they did. Uh, so it's basically an HTTP request with payloads in both ways. Mm. We used to send back the response as a JSON, which then was compressed with GZIP. Uh, nowadays, the browsers support us sending binary data, which is really good, because previously the problem was that, that uh, the mesh data had to be taken out of the JSON uh, and then pushed into WebGL uh, arrays. And it turns this is not uh, JavaScript's strong points, like manipulating tons of tiny bits of data. Uh, so so what, it, what ends up happening now, we actually get the, the binary data. We just dump that into WebGL. And then we have a separate process that parses out. We also embed JSON data. So now we, what we do is instead of having like a meg of mesh data needs to be transferred from JSON to binary. We have like a few K of JSON data needs to take from binary to, to like text format, which is much more feasible. Um, so that's the client view. Uh, if you take away the apply geometry piece, you basically get our heartbeat. So we don't advertise this and we haven't actually exposed it to users, uh, but um, you can, several people can edit one part at the same time wherever they are. Like you can have 10 browser windows open and just edit the same part. The reason we haven't exposed is we don't know how to do the UI yet for it correctly yet. It's not, it's very confusing. Like we used to have uh, edit wars at the, at the company where basically like we have all, all the people pile in on the part and just keep like editing. And it's very fun, but it's, it's, it gets very confusing quick. It also gets rude very quick depending on your founders. Um, but we, we don't, we, it's a very interesting piece of functionality. You can do stuff like the viewer does heartbeats too. So if you do a class, you could actually like show the part uh, and then have people open it up in the viewer and they're gonna see your updates as you edit the part, which is pretty okay. Um, the technology is there though. Server side, uh, this is more interesting. So um, or more interesting, uh, obviously more interesting because I'm a server side programmer, not a, not a client programmer. Uh, so yes. This is obviously recorded, so our UI engineer will watch it at some point and totally kill me for this. But um, what happens on the server is, is um, the client actually, once it got the HTTP request for initial page, it actually takes, um, opens the XHR uh, connection to secondary server, which is our kind of, we call them the edge servers. Um, the edge server gets in the request. It prune, It goes through the list of, of blocks that, that, that we're currently operating against. It basically builds a primary list of blocks for the new uh, geometry we got. So if, there's, if we're kind of an, uh, adding a cube, it, it, it does a simple run where it figures out, okay, this cube will touch these and these blocks. Um, it, it, those cases where, where it's completely inside a cube uh, and the existing block data says we're completely inside, uh, kind of these Boolean cases that, that this block uh, on, on left hand, the left hand side block is full, the right hand side block is completely full. It prunes those out because obviously those are very simple to compute. So it just like calculates them to figures out what the result is. We have hard coded UIDs for, for totally full and totally empty blocks. Um, all the border cases are packed up, split up into, they're basically put on a queue 
uh, the the server kind of fires off all the all the requests to the to the solid servers. Uh, the solid servers are are the bulk of the cluster. So uh, we run, I think, 80 solid servers at this point. Um, each solid server has a little uh, QoS-based queue. Uh, it, it takes in requests from the edge, processes those requests in based on the QoS, um, and then sends the results back. So the edge, all, all edge does is it's very lightly loaded server. All it does is take in the request, does some initial really easy pruning to to take out the easy bits fire off all the different bits to all the solids, and then waiting for the responses. And as the responses are coming in, um, we actually like um, put them together in the fly. So the edge edge uh, gets flayed blocks, and we have like an open gzip uh, response so that, that we can actually get the flayed blocks in different orders. It doesn't matter. Like as soon as it starts getting responses back, it starts sending bytes back to the client, and then eventually the, all the meshes arrive and bang, you're done. There's a bunch of retry mechanism. This is this is those of you guys server programming. This is obviously not as simple, right? You need to do retries. Uh, machines go down, etc., etc., etc. So there's a bunch of stuff going on to make sure that everything actually arrives. But uh, that's roughly what Edge does. Mm. The solids do the actual work. Uh, they get two blocks of data. The Edge actually sends the block at, the, at this point to the solids. Uh, they perform the boolean operation. Uh, they mesh the volumetric data, create a new kind of representational mesh of it. Uh, this mesh is really dense. It has tons and tons and tons of triangles. It runs a dozen simplification passes over that mesh, basically to throw out triangles to make it more more uh, easier to visualize, visualize. And then it encodes the results, uh, compresses the results, and sends the results back to, to the edge. Uh, our target deadline for all of this is 400 milliseconds. We mostly make it. Um, we have issues with, with laggards. So uh, if, if a solid server is overloaded or slow for some reason, uh, that slows down the whole request at this point. We've been thinking of doing optimizations like sending it to two solids, having some kind of deadline. If you, if you don't get a response back in like 50 milliseconds, uh, send it to some other solid and so forth. So just, uh, I don't know if you, who of you guys worked on, on search. This is very familiar to the type of problem search says. Um, the difference is we can't drop we can't degrade quality. We can't basically take a step back and say, oh, it's OK if only half of them succeed. Because obviously, what's going to happen for, for the user is, is they're going to get something weird looking because half of the stuff is missing. So we actually have to get everything completed to be, be able to return the request. But there's a lot of stuff we could to, do, I think, to push that 400 milliseconds down. Um, you'll also note this is a single pass algorithm. We talked earlier about, about uh, um, how you need to have overlap. Uh, specifically, the simplification is, is the part where overlap is crucial. Uh, we could do meshing without having overlap. OK, that's not true. We need to have one, one sample overlap to do meshing properly, I think. And we need to have two samples overlap to do, uh, do simplification correctly, because we need to calculate normals. Um, we've seen issues which are very, very uh, uncomfortable, where different machines do the same operations and get different results. Most of those has been tracked down to some kind of floating issues. Uh, we don't like floating point. Um, we very much don't like floating point. Uh, the problem is it doesn't seem to be a de deterministic system to do stuff. Um, this is obviously a problem where two, two different uh, solids compute a result. The mesh doesn't match up. And then because we use actually this mesh to send to the printers, we get the same problems you get from a wrap that there's like issues, cracks in the thing. We think we fixed all of them, at least the known ones. But obviously, there might be some, some of them lurking. Uh, the good thing is that if we screw up with meshing the solid, um, with a B-rep, your model is screwed. Like It's very, very hard to, to kind of go back and, and totally fix it. In our case, we can just push a code fix. And then as soon as you do a remeshing, which we always do, like once you load a part up the first time, we actually remesh the whole part on the fly. Uh, so for us, it's, it's like a, uh, the solid representation is always stable. And if we have a problem with the B-rep, we can just like push a code change, and then everybody gets the fixes immediately, which is, we think, a better. It's like a one-way one flow of data. Um, so that's the server side. Questions? OK. So. WebGL. Um, so the rest of the stuff I'm going to I'm, I'm talk about WebGL uh, and Go, which are kind of the two big new things we use. We use a bunch of we use a bit of C++ for 
for the inner loops in the, the kind of the solid operations. We wrote the three first generations in Go, uh, but the fourth one, we basically ran into, into SSE optimization issues. So SSE optimization on GCC is just so much better. And it, the difference wasn't too big. Uh, we basically got, we benchmarked the last version and we got, uh, Go was about 1.7 times slower. But uh, in our case, that's actually important. And the second one is, is that the code, there was a bit of code blow up. The, the Go code wasn't as easy to read, which is interesting because all the distributed code is much, much smaller. Uh, anyway, oh, uh, WebGL. Uh, the big good thing is WebGL looks very, very, very similar, similar to OpenGL in ES. Um, I'm probably going to be corrected here, but I think it's, it's almost one-to-one -one with the ES spec. Right, yeah. So it's, it's almost one-to-one -one with the ES spec. This is big. ES is um, for, I don't know what it actually stands for, but it's basically like for mobile devices like iPads and iPhones and so forth. Um, our main UI coder, or graphics coder, has done games for 20 years, and he's done like OpenGL for years and years and years. But he, the last few years, he'd been basically working on the iPad. And in fact, he, he's never done any, he, he started doing JavaScript nine months ago, which I think is, is impressive. But the fact that, that he could basically drop in on, on WebGL without any thoughts about how it works was super, super cool. So this for us was like a huge, huge thing compared to almost any other API, like Flash is talking about 3D API and stuff. All of those would have meant that we would have to learn a new API to get up to speed. With WebGL, it was just like drop in and you're done. This was super, super important. Uh, one of the problems is that the, the, the browser adds one more layer between us and the graphics hardware. Um, those who've done graphics coding know that graphics hardware is, is famously dodgy. It's, it's very, they have a different idea of what stable means compared to, to say, say normal G, CPU manufacturers. Uh, there's tons of bugs in drivers, there's tons of bugs in other things. Um, we run into some issues where we're basically, we, we don't know if it's our problem, uh, the driver problem, or a browser problem. Um, not too many. In most cases, so far, it's been our problem, so which is pretty common. Um, this is a two-edged sword. A sword. Uh, one hand, uh, this makes some bugs for us slightly harder to to debug. On the other hand, we believe that this is the first time, probably in history, when there's like a focused group that can put pressure on on graphics uh, card vendors to to actually write decent drivers. Like, now there's like somebody who can actually say, yes, we're running this thing. We need to make it run like for a while. Uh, so let's make sure this actually works. Uh, we, we think this dynamics is good. We'd rather have, have like the Chrome people push on NVIDIA and ATI to get better drivers than have us push on, push on the same. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it was comment was basically that the, the graphics card driver or graphics card manufacturers say that there's a different class of devices called workstation cards, and then those are more stable and so forth. Um, I'll tell you a story. So, um, ATI manufactures a card called FireGL, which is a workstation card. Um, you're almost right, but not quite. Um, I, I used to write code for FireGL, and um, one of the things I was, I was writing points. And um, there's, there's a view plane, right? And, and I had points like basically all, all around the, the viewer. Uh, when a point would go behind a view plane, what the spec says should happen is nothing. The point should disappear, obviously, because it's no longer visible, it's behind a view plane and so forth. Uh, what happened was that the point blew up to a full screen fill. So you could get this, like, it was, it, I think it costed two grand at the time, the card. It was a very expensive card. You could get this two grand card on its knees by rendering 200 points. I, I dialed them up and said, like, what? And the answer was basically, no CAD vendor uses points. Go away. Uh, they, didn't have, they never fixed it. What happens actually is, is and this happens in games too, like high-end games. Uh, they, they coordinate the... the the vendors of high-end CAD software or, or, high -end, or like AA games, they coordinate with the graphics card drivers so that they actually like, uh, in, in terms of workstation, they release drivers very rarely and then they certify the application against those drivers. So, so they basically fix all the bugs until the like Maya or, or 3D Studio works and then they say like, ship it. And with games, they, they occasionally do stuff like if they have an AA release, 
uh, on some specific date, they release a new driver like two days earlier, which they've been debugging for the past month and sync it with the game to make sure that all those people who buy the game in the first week are going to get a good experience, which means that half a year later you might actually not, actually not get the game to work as well. So that's, that's the solution to this problem. It's basically like backroom lobbying and so forth. We're not powerful enough, enough to do it, so we hope the Chrome team is. Um, did I answer the question, by the way, or address the comment? Okay. Um, you need to be careful about managing data on the JavaScript side. We talked about the fact that we don't put the solid data on JavaScript side. Uh, blow up is crazy. Um, JavaScript is not a language for doing, doing tiny, like comp having data in a very, very small space. It's a language for doing something very different. Um, we've seen it with, with kind of auxiliary structures, like picking structures, trees to be able to pick different structures and so forth. Um, it's, it's, we need to be really careful about how we encode those. Uh, the encoding you would do in picking like Go or C++ isn't necessarily the encoding you want to have on the JavaScript side. Um, okay, in general, it's just it's still early days. We launched basically, I think, a few weeks after Chrome went to stable with WebGL. We came out with the public beta, so we're like, we're so so much on the leading edge as you can be. Uh, but currently, this is absolutely the best option for doing 3D in the browser, hands down. There's no question about it. We, we like the fact that it's standard. We hope it's going to stay being the best option as well. But currently, as, as if you want to do something today, this is your best bet. Go. Thank you. Uh, let's spend it all on Go. Um, Go is a programming language from Google, um, if you guys are not aware of it. It, it looks, um, I keep saying it's a better C. Um, we wrote five core servers in Go. Uh, HTTP, these are, are kind of, um, the one that serves the site and does the basic requests. Edge, it's a server we talked about. It also serves HTTP, but it basically serves application requests. Uh, solid service, again, this one you've seen before, is, is the ones that actually do the processing. The solid service is actually a Go process that embeds uh, a C++ process, or it, it starts the C++ process under the cover to basically like do the, do the actual work. But all the coordination work is done by the Go thing. The C++ thing is super simple. It takes in a, a set of bytes crunches, crunches, and, and gives out a set of bytes. The Go side actually does the lot, most of the logic. Uh, lock service is chubby style lock server. Um, it's, uh, we currently don't run a Paxos DB under it, but we're thinking of adding, uh, there's something called Doocer, which is written in, also written in Go, which is, as far as we know, the best option for adding Paxos in any language currently. Uh, we're probably gonna put um, a, a Paxos-based store under it. Uh, it provides locks, it provides uh, atomic small files, it provides a cache, client-based cache. Um, if, you, if you know Chubby, this, this looks very much like Chubby. Uh, Node is our, our uh, we run Node on every single machine. It's kind of our log collections slash user space process management thing. Uh, you make sure that the process is on the, on, on the, um, when the machine gets restarted, that we actually capture the logs, send them out, you collect them and analyze the data and so forth. Uh, the node is, is then obviously the, the kept alive by init. It's a very small piece of code. We try to keep it really stable. Uh, we also have three auxiliary ser servers written in Go. Uh, Sentinel is our, our monitoring server. It pulls, um, pulls data from the node servers in real time and kind of gives an ability to, to get graphs, uh, analyze logs, do runtime, like operational analysis of what's, that, what's happening. Uh, Prober is a load tester slash slash kind of um, testing framework. We also run in a cluster. Uh, auto deploy is our, our um, continuous deployment daemon. So we run Perforce. Um, surprise coming from Google. Uh, we run Perforce and, and then auto deploy listens to the Perforce stream. Whenever there's a special tag saying deploy, it basically pushes those changes out to cluster, make sure everything is fine, pulls back if things doesn't work out and so forth. So we don't do manual deploys at all. Uh, we used to have the facility for doing manual deploys, uh, but it turns out after six months we haven't done a single one, so we just ripped it out and then use auto deploy. Uh, it's, 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 it's totally a lifesaver. It's, it's super great to have ability to push out. We push changes to the site maybe um, five or six times a day, maybe 10 or 15 times a day, depending on how active we are, uh, depending on the day what you're coding on. Mm -hmm. so, so the site is, is almost always uh, very close to the, to the tip of code. Um, we like Go. Um, I used to work on the Go team while I was at Google. I've done a bunch of, of Go programming before I, I even like uh, left for the startup. Um, I think at this point in time, 
Go is probably the best language to write concurrent servers in. Um, there's, there's Erlang, there's a bunch of other languages. Um, I think Go has a nice combination of, of C style, very tight memory layout management, which is something we need a lot for because we push so much data around. We need to be really careful with every bit, how, how we kind of push data, how it looks in memory to make, make caches work and so forth. Uh, and also the, the only language where we can do this and at the same time have a very good concurrent server. Like, like Edge runs a ton of stuff, a uh, ton of Go routines to keep track of all the different states, um, which means that the, the different Go routines are super short and simple. It's really easy to follow them. This would be very, very hard to write in any language. It's hard to describe, like I've done a lot of C++ development and a lot of other languages. Uh, we just feel more productive and fast writing servers in Go. It's hard to say. Like all these, these are probably good reasons, but I would not like. You have to pry it from my cold dead hands at this point. Um, C plus plus is faster and more productive for computational geometry. We found that we, we talked about the really the small inner loops. The main problem is Go doesn't currently inline functions. So we end up using a lot of tiny functions for tons of, of weird operations. And the second thing is, is C++ um, or GCC specifically actually SSA and uh, SSE encodes these. So um, in the end, we found that the, the really these kind of the loops, they're, they're kind of weird code. We use, we use some things in C++ which aren't pretty, but it makes us, as, makes us lets us compress those inner loops to, to a shorter span which makes them readable because they're really difficult algorithmic problems. And, and if even a small blow up makes them really hard to read. Um, so for example, uh, macros, we use a ton of macros to get inlining very fast. And then we use uh, templates in some cases to, to uh, do some functions where you have, you have templates on, on float 32 and float, uh, float 64, and you can basically, you can read the code the same way even if you use two different types of float, that type of stuff. So I think those are, those are the ones that, that are really like, I think inlining is the biggest one. Like if we had inlining, we'd probably be much closer. For us, the performance is, is a killer eventually as well. It wasn't earlier, but at this point it is. Um, we're still debating about that one, but at this point C++ feels better. We're probably gonna do a benchmark again with generation five. Um, Go nodes, and this is my last slide. Uh, we run servers with Go max prox equals one, which means Go is, we find Go to be super good for concurrent stuff, but we don't. We find actually we get better performance out of it if we manage the parallel stuff on a process level as opposed to inside a process. So for example, uh, we, we treat GC, at this point we treat GC slowdowns as any other type of slowdown, like network slowdown and so forth. Like our, our architecture doesn't differentiate between a GC running on a solid or, or the network just being slow to the solid or it being constrained in terms of CPU or something. So we, we, we did a bunch of benchmark, benchmarks that came to the conclusion that we, we pushed the parallel stuff one, one level above. Um, we use protobuffers for storage. We need to, to munch data in, in a number of languages, use gobs for transfer, uh, pretty easy. Naming convention. Um, we have we have a hard time finding good names for for functions that are are at the root for Go routines and then for channels. Uh, this is what we came up with. We call everything where you you say Go foo. We call it Go foo loop, and, and that way you can kind of identify the entry point. This is something if you're not a Go program, that's not going to make sense. Go programmers are probably going to nod in or have some really good suggestion. Uh, we'd love to know how other people do it because this seems like a good con some convention here seems useful. Um, we use sync source request response uh, as names for for channels to kind of signify uh, flow of data, direction of data, and so forth. Uh, we again we found channels we found that channels kind of require slightly more uh, ornamental naming than normal variables because often they're they're in a slightly different position than normal variables. Um, and then if you come with C plus plus, which was a really hard hard thing for our poor for a graphics coder, uh, he used he, he's like a stickler with memory. He cares like when he he's, he writes code, he he like he feels pain for every malloc that's in there. Uh, and he basically until he realized that he can't do stack allocation, he was he was just killing himself. Like in Go, the problem is st stack. What you think of in C plus plus as stack allocation might actually be a heap allocation, which obviously does not make um, him happy, right? So once he figured out that he do, needs to use arenas and pre-allocated blocks of memory and stuff, he, he was fine. But it was something that was just like, it was very hard for him to, to grasp. Um, that's about our experiences. Thanks. This is a MakerBot, one of the 3D printers, by the way.
These girls love it. Questions? Shoot. So, uh, you're going to the BSP We don't know how, so the question was, do you need to, do we consider using BSP representation? Um, we don't think BSP is, BSP is a pretty specific type of, of uh, representation. We think it works for, for game levels really well. Uh, we don't know how to do good booleans on them, for starters. I think, you, I think a good boolean would boil down to about the BREP type of boolean. It's an interesting question, though. No, we really didn't think about it too much, but I, I assume because we, we kind of put them into in the BRF class. Yeah, I'm used to the, uh, like the Unreal editor. Like, that's why I was just wondering if you had to do that. Right, exactly. Well, the, the, so the, the, your comment was that the, the Unreal editor has, has bool and BS for right? Then it's certainly possible. So, okay, fair enough. I don't know. We didn't consider it, no. Question. So one of the things that I've liked about using uh, OpenSCAD text-based rather than graphical, um, is that if I make 37 Boolean operations and then I realize that the third one is wrong and I want to change it by 20%, I go back and tweak it and get the wrong result. Do you have any plans for putting something like that? Okay, so the computer software engineer in the first row said that he likes a program called OpenSCAD, which is basically a CAD program where you write programs and you end up with a Boolean result. Um, yes. We, we thought about doing specifically where, uh, and this is a roadmap, we haven't like figured out when and where, but it's pretty clear that it would make a ton of sense to be able to take an open SCAD program and have them have the solid appear in Tinkercad. We think that seems like a very like clear use case. Uh, we don't know when we're going to get to it yet, but uh, we think open SCAD is actually the coolest thing ever on the planet. Uh, if Tinkercad is something where you just like do concrete modeling and, and it's very like tangible, uh, OpenSCAD is the one where if you want like control and, and need to do more, there's a lot of shapes that are very hard to do by hand, like like helixes and stuff, and, and um, those are are fantastic to do by OpenSCAD. So we think that that OpenSCAD, we, we we like to have OpenSCAD to kind of be our the parametric part of our our software at some point. If that answers your question, we love it. We love to integrate with them. Is, is the summary? I think there was one more somewhere. There. So what users are you? Okay, so question was, what users are we targeting who we expect for the primary? Um, at this point, we're targeting makers. So roughly anybody who has some, uh, a 3D printer, uh, access to Shapeways or uses Shapeways, or anybody who, who wants to do it. We, we find a lot of people who, uh, they, currently we think there's about, this segment is about 200,000 people, roughly. There's much less printers and much less people who actually use Shapeways. But a lot of the people who come into our, use Tinkercad, like right now in the beta, are basically like, Wow, this is cool. I should buy a printer. So, so we 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 find ourselves leading kind of the adoption of the printers. So it seems like people first want to try it out to see how it, how it works, how they can do stuff. And once they they feel like, wow, I can actually this looks pretty cool. I want to go and and print this out. So that's kind of the, the segment we're targeting first. Um, that's the segment that has the most pains at this point. There is isn't really a good, especially a good browser-based solution for for makers who want to do something on on let's say MakerBot. Okay, so the question was, how does the data get to the printer? Um, there is, um, in projects, you can download an STL file, and the STL file is, is the standard file format that all, all, almost all the printer, printer drivers take. So you basically take that and drop into the printer driver software, and you're done. Uh, if we had integrate, we, we were probably going to integration with Shapeways, so what, what that would mean is, is you wouldn't have to do this step, you would just say print, and then bang, we would take care of sending data to Shapeways, they would print it and send you the, the model back. Question? So you said that the mesh data is sent back in binary line, um, so WebGL has some JavaScript probably that you're going to attempt to use to send that back? So the question was, uh, we're sending, um, that we're sending the, the data back as binary to the browser. And the question, does WebGL have some way of, of taking, here's a bunch of binary data, put it in vertex array. Yes, it does. Uh, this is fairly new as of, I think the spec only finalized a month ago or so. Okay. Okay, so I'm correct, it's been around for a while, so we just haven't implemented it. But yeah. So the, 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 uh, 
the comment was that is it just like packing uh, versus an, an index arrays in open, or vertex arrays in OpenGL? Yes. So basically, the server packs them in, in the binary format, which is then exactly dropped into the vertex arrays to get the final data. And we just, some of the data, we just parse some beginning of the data to actually get our JSON out to have the, the rest of the response. Question? The, the two Boolean operations we have, are those sufficient to, to scale modeling? Or is there something specific about printing these models that would vary, for example? So the question was that we only have two Boolean operations. Uh, is this sufficient for complex modeling? Uh, and is there something in the printing that inherently requires us just to use two? Um, so I'll answer the second part first. No, there isn't anything inherent in printing that requires us to use just two. We could use any. Um, I think there's 16 in total. Um, that may, like if you have two things, there's a bunch of mirror ones and so forth. Um, you whittle down, I think you get five that makes sense. Um, there, there's obviously stuff like XR and things which you could do. Um, we did not actually think the user would find them useful. Like, like we, we walked down the list and, and adding and subtracting are seem to be the only ones that are, are actually needed to get stuff done. We can think of corner cases. It would be really cool to have some really, like one of the more uh, odd combinations, but it's not clear that that's actually, so adding a third operation is, is uh, added kind of user interface cost. It makes it again more complex. It's one more thing for users to learn. Uh, so far, we think, uh, based on the feedback, that adding more operation would be more, uh, would do more damage in, in making the application harder to use compared to the power it would add to, to users in some special cases. Almost all the special cases we, we figure come come up with, uh, there's some better way of solving that special case than using a Boolean operation. A lot of times people want to do like circles and stuff, and the, the solution is for us to add a, a sphere tool instead of, of adding, of having just cylinders. So in most cases, we found that there's a better solution than adding one. We're open, obviously, to adding. It's very simple on the code side. But uh, the decision to just have two is, is basically a UI decision. I wasn't thinking about Boolean operation, but if you want to do a twist or paper, or, you know, so some, some other... Ah, uh, OK. So so the, the comment was basically a twist or taper or some other modification. Yes. Um, we want to do all of those. But now that you guys know the, the internal representation, uh, doing a taper is essentially shoveling around a ton of bits because we we need to redefine how the whole whole kind of um, like solid model does. Doing affinity transference is not easy with this representation. It's doable, but it's not easy. We want to add those. There's a bunch. We want to add the stretch, for example, that you could take, grab two ends of a piece and stretch it to have the middle stretch out and stuff like that, or kind of rotate and so forth. Oh, question. Sorry. Yeah. Um, can you say something about how hard it was to bring I hear the you. other members? You can't hear me? You there? Can, can you say something about how hard it was to bring the other members up to speed on Go? You need to unmute yourself. Nah. OK, it doesn't work. We'll pass. The other side can hear you fine, but they sorry. can hear you. Sorry. <laughs> OK, there you go. <laughs> Any more questions? What? Do you think uh, like, have you thought about for it be totally rejected, like adding So the question was, have we totally ruled out adding more organic tools, like game tools, like ZBrush or, and, and that type of tools do? OK, yeah, we like 3D Studio and those kind. Uh No, we haven't. Uh, we decided to, to try to target mechanical shapes initially, because we felt that there was a bigger lack of, of a tool to do mechanical shapes. Um, actually, to get these sharp corners and, and kind of sharp features we have is much more difficult than doing organic shapes. Um, technically, we need to do a lot of magic on the data to actually extract where a sharp corner is. The default for this data format would be organic shapes. The reason why most of the kind of these this, uh, set brush type of tools uh, have soft shapes but don't don't have too much sharp shapes is because sharp shapes are actually harder. Um, we wanted to do sharp shapes first, so that that basically one, if we, once we've done them, it's easy to go back to organic ones. Uh, I just saw yesterday somebody had modeled a bunny in Tinkercad by basically like painstakingly making the tool shape smaller and smaller and basically going in and, and like cutting off smaller and smaller pieces of it. Uh, yeah, 
he probably spent like seven hours or it on something. It was a cool looking bunny, but I was like, I was like, we really need to add some tools to help you out. So, so yeah, I, I think there's there's definitely a need for more more kind of softer tools to 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 it. From my point of view, it's just more tools. It's it's pretty easy to add them technically, but we just haven't like we don't want to. We're trying to keep a, a, a break on all UI changes to make sure that the product stays really simple, really conservative in adding new stuff. But this seems to be something that people want to do. They want to like take real world things and, and model it. So we probably have to, we're probably going to go down that road at some point. So this you can do kind of like with virtual woodworking or like maybe that person making something is like carving out of stone where this is like doing stuff with clay. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's more artists doing it these days than there was back in the day, I would think. So. Yeah. The comment was basically this is more like woodworking as opposed to, to working with clay. Um, I actually wanted it to be more working like clay. Uh, nowadays, when you see an operation, you basically make a line, uh, and that line is then done. And I wanted it to be like a freeform brush, so you could like go like this. And then my, my dear co-founders vetoed the fact that we would need like 10 or 20 times more machines for this. And it seems like we didn't make it for version 1. Uh, we might still make it eventually, but it's obviously computationally much more intensive to do something like that. Question. Okay, so question was, if you want to make a cube that was hollow inside, uh, do you have to basically like make the cube, take out the inners, and then add a lid? Or could you actually go in and take the inside out? Uh, you can actually go in and take the inside out. So, so if you if you position the work plane, I'll actually show you show it because it's not too difficult. So, um, I move the work plane up a bit, like this. I take a, I gonna do it like, actually I need to make it smaller. So, so I'll show it just on a corner because otherwise you're not gonna see it. So there's a tiny hole in there. So I could do the same thing in the middle of here or somewhere where there isn't actually stuff. Okay, there's a tiny hole in there. The problem <laughs> is obviously you don't see the hole. But if you went if you went out and printed this, there there would actually the printer would make a hole in the middle and that's it. Um, like you, as you see, the problem isn't the fact that you can't do it. The problem is that the the user feedback for the holes in the middle of the part is lacking. <laughs> that's a proper term. So could, I could have a floating inside that hole. You could have a float, so the, the comment was you could have a floating thing inside. There's actually a model which has a whistle with the ball of the whistle inside the whistle, uh, and and it doesn't fall down because there's like a tiny support strut. Once you print it, uh, you basically like a screwdriver, pop it loose, and now we have a fully working whistle with a ball that that never was inserted in the first place. That that kind of when you when you print that out to people, it kind of blows people's mind, especially because it's a very loud whistle. I love it. <laughs> Questions. Okay. Okay. So, question was, uh, what about extensions? Uh, we love to do them. A uh, bunch of people have asked uh, asked us about them, obviously already. Uh, making a good extension API is hard. Uh, we're currently not doing it. We're not going to do it right away. Uh, we want to think about it a bit. We want to mainly collect what type of extensions people want to make. A bunch of the stuff people want to make is basically uh, stuff we want to do anyway. They're like they're missing features, and, and they're like, wow, I want to do an extension to this. We're like, oh, that's really cool, but we actually think we're going to do it ourselves. Uh, I think there is a valid world of, of doing extensions that are more that aren't like core features. Uh, for example, integrating with OpenSCAD would open up kind of an extension world because then you could write OpenSCAD programs and stuff. Um, this is something we're obviously interested in. I agree with you. This is a good tool that could be used as a platform as well. Uh, and we certainly like, we ourselves have tons of, there was, was a, Vijay was here all, earlier, he was basically, um, someone was talking about a height map they have like height map data and they wanted to print it out, but Shapeways basically says they can't print out the height map, they need a solid model. So basically they could write a little Python script to, to take the height map and import it into Tinkercad or some other arbitrary type of data which you happen to have have like lying around and you want to solve the model from. So yes, we want to do it, but it's we don't want to rush into it because it's actually, we think it's, designing good APIs is hard. Okay, question. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, what they basically did is like they gained their own fan software and kind of already have it. So it seems like it might be, um, I mean, at least one way to implement this is you want to uh, you know, programmatically do some uh, complex behavior. But then the time it has to just basically do the behavior is not that long. It's like maybe like two minutes or something like that. That basically takes the work away from the fan back to the pad and then it's just like a little bit more time. So the, I wonder how I should summarize your comment. Um, you basically uh, talked about adding more cam-like features, but I think um, without going into detail, you just described something we're about to implement in a few months. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. If I understood correctly, I might not have. More questions? Okay, I think we're done. Thank you. Thank you.